into the uh, continuous integration space. Our speaker today is uh, Rohit Gatol. Uh, he's director of engineering at Synergip. Uh, uh, but mainly Rohit's role is uh, that of a technology evangelist. He's uh, uh, deeply invested in technology, uh, in building applications, and in, in driving uh, 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 DevOps uh, sort of initiatives as well as uh, uh, automated uh, QA. He's written uh, uh, books on the topic, and uh, I think uh, this will be an interesting conversation. So, uh, but before I hand over to Rohit, I just want to cover a, a couple of logistics. Uh, uh, so, this is a, a fairly uh, detailed uh, conversation. Although we'll uh, we'll uh, keep it at an overview level, but if if uh, uh, you, uh, anybody has questions, feel free to. Uh, put them down through the chat channel, and uh, we'll take pauses to uh, make sure uh, the questions uh, get answered. Uh, uh, and we don't really have to wait till the very end. You're also welcome to uh, uh, pick up any uh, any questions toward the end as well. Uh, the second thing is uh, that this uh, uh, this webinar is recorded, and it's available. Or uh, it will will be available in a, uh, in a couple of days. Uh, uh, on our YouTube channel, uh, which can be accessed from our website, www.synergip.com. So, without much ado, let me uh, hand it over to Rohit. So, uh, Rohit, uh, it's over to you now. Yeah, Ashish, thanks for the introduction. So, guys, today we're going to talk about a uh, um, couple of things. We're going to talk about Docker. Uh, we'll be starting with a little introduction uh, of Docker. This will be helpful to anybody who doesn't know about it. And then we'll be going towards uh, the use cases of Docker. Uh, primarily, we'll be talking about continuous delivery and few other use cases. Uh, please remember, this is a 45 minutes uh, long uh, talk from my side. So we'll be at 50,000 feet. Uh, and uh, like Ashish said, we'll invite questions in between. So hang in there, guys. So <clears throat> first thing first uh, about Docker. Docker is both uh, a technology as well as a name of a company. So I just put in this slide so there's no confusion about it for people who don't know much about it. It's a lightweight container technology for virtualization, the same virtualization which are used to on virtual boxes, VMware. But it's lightweight in nature because of something called as container technology. We'll go into that after a few slides. Uh, quite frankly, Docker has been the fastest growing technology in the last two years. There has been colossal adoption rate. And uh, Docker initially was a company called as Dot Cloud. And that's when it's released uh, Docker as an open source platform. And then it was uh, renamed to Docker. And uh, it's a privately held company now. Uh, it's got good amount of funding. And the earlier platform which it used to have called as Dot Cloud, the PaaS platform, it was a PaaS platform uh, where you can deploy your applications, that now has been sold out. And that means the company is well funded and the company is totally focused on Docker platform. So that's a small introduction of uh, Docker. Uh, moving on, I'll be telling about few names, uh, very, very few names about who uses Docker um, as, a, as, as companies who want to deploy their SaaS products, as companies who allow to deploy SaaS products and other things. So this is uh, a list of name of companies which I just picked up from Docker. Uh, of course, the list is much bigger than that. It's just difficult to find out who is writing Docker and who is not. So we've got a couple of big names over here, eBay, Baidu, Yelp, and Spotify. But the list is uh, much bigger than this. And all the new age uh, SaaS people, um, I'm hearing that they are writing on a Docker uh, platform. Over here, you will see uh, the names of IAS and PAS players on the left-hand side are the major players, uh, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform. Uh, these platforms allow you to host your Dockerized applications on top of them. Amazon Web Services is also launching a platform called as Elastic Container Service, which is currently by invite only. Uh, in the middle, you will see few examples. It's, um, I put in a, a name of a company called as DigitalOcean. It's a smaller 
fast player, much more affordable. It also supports uh, deploying Docker as application. On the right hand side, you'll see names of the company uh, which are which would be very, very new to you because these are companies which specialize in Docker hosting. Dot Cloud, as I said, uh, is from Docker itself, currently sold out. Tutum is a service which allows you to host on Amazon, on uh, DigitalOcean, on Google Cloud, etc. So it helps ease the portability part. StackDoc is pure hosting, Docker hosting. Uh, QU is basically uh, hosting of uh, Docker images and not really uh, Docker applications. So you'll see more about this as we go ahead. Um, as part of the introduction, one more thing is if you are into DevOps and if you guys are using anything like Chef, Puppet, Ansible, Vagrant, or good old Jenkins, uh, these tools now have support for Docker. So you don't have to move away from your current DevOps platform, but you can enhance it using Docker. So that's about the introduction of uh, Docker. I'm going to head over to the continuous delivery part. Uh, Ashish, are there any questions? So, uh, so Roy, one of the questions that uh, sort of uh, comes to mind is, uh, it, it appears like Docker is uh, everything to everybody. Uh, are there any limitations in terms of uh, specific environments it supports? So I saw Microsoft Azure, I, so does it uh, work on Windows as well as Unix, or I could elaborate on that? So Docker is primarily uh, a Unix technology. That means it runs on top of Unix. Uh, so not Unix, uh, Linux. It runs on top of Linux. Uh, so that's primary limitation. But if you see uh, Windows platform and Mac platform also supports you running Docker. Uh, they would run a, a very thin layer of Linux and then you will run your applications on top of that. The way Microsoft supports is it for Mono. Uh, so ASP.NET 5 and uh, these frameworks are currently built for cross-platform, so they can also uh, run on top of uh, Docker. Okay. All right. So let's move ahead to the topic of continuous delivery. Let's understand continuous delivery at the basic uh, thing. This is a cycle which we all know, build, deploy, test, and release. Uh, and the cycle keeps on going ahead, uh, going on. Um, the cycles are typically uh, every sprint or every two sprint nowadays. Uh, the important aspect is what flows in this cycle. There are four components when you're, when you're talking about deploying your application on, uh, 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 let's say, on, on, on cloud. Your app, your executable, your logic, your database or initial data, your config information about the application, and your host environment, which is your uh, OS, what kind of libraries, what versions are there. So all these things. So the problem which typically happens is while you're shipping these four uh, components in this cycle, it's much of a, a DIY kit. The developer would actually uh, ship the binary somehow, maybe using continuous integration, but rest uh, used to be instruction sets for the operations people. And there would be merge version mismatch, configuration mismatch, things like that. And that's how uh, uh, that was a major problem about continuous delivery a uh, few years back. What's been happening now is uh, for managing the application executable and making sure it's well tested and the same executable moves in the cycle, we have used tools like Jenkins and Bamboo over a, over a decade now. And things are going well in that direction. Uh, on the other hand, when you talk about uh, the host environment and configuration, in the last three, four years, tools like Vagan, Puppet, Chef, they have become very, very popular. But what they do is mimic what a human being does. A human being would come and he would uh, provision a virtual machine. Then the person would come and the person would uh, provision softwares one by one. And this definitely is not very, very fast. It takes uh, slightly less time than what operations of DevOps people would do by hand. Uh, and these instructions are often not repeatable due to many things. Sometimes there are version breaks, sometimes there are network connection issues, things like that. So while we have DevOps, it's, it's not there where we want to be, and we are still mimicking an operations person. 
So Docker takes this thing to the next level. What it says is enough of uh, enough of us uh, moving the components around. Let's put all these components inside a container and move the container itself. So that's the basic thing what you're going to talk about today. So uh, Ashish, I want to check with you. Uh, are there any other questions coming up at this time? Uh, the only thing, uh, one of the question I am seeing here is, uh, 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 in, your, in your slides, I guess, uh, uh, what this person is asking is, in your slide you show all the uh, application components always going together. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's some way to, if, let's say I just needed to do, uh, you know, installation of database separately. Uh, or manage database within a container separately. Uh, is that a possibility? Or, or do all stack elements have to go together? Oh, sorry, in this slide. This slide, uh, in this slide, um, it's not that they're going into one con container. I'm just depicting it that I'm putting it into a container. Uh, I could very well have uh, two or three com uh, containers, which can be wired together very easily. But the whole idea is the database would definitely be in a separate container. Uh, uh, and uh, let's say you have a web app that will be in a separate container. If you have a solar uh, based indexing server, that will be a different container. But the whole idea is whatever I'm passing, I'm passing in its own completeness. So I'm sorry that the DB part confuses uh, in this case. But think about app config and the environment in one container acting like a web server and think about DB config and environment in another container acting like the actual database. So okay. it's not one container which goes around, it's multiple containers which goes around. And uh, if you guys are aware of microservices, well, every microservice goes in a different container. So think about it that way. Okay. All right. So we're gonna move to the next part, which is we're gonna quickly cover the landscape, uh, what people typically do when they deploy SaaS applications today. Uh, this is a typical flow. I'm, I'm very sure you guys are uh, well versed with uh, this, uh, this flow. This is a very simplistic flow. Uh, the business logic starts from a developer's box. Uh, he tests the code locally. He would check in the code. Uh, some kind of a continuous integration server, uh, the old servers like Jenkins or Bamboos or now the new ones like Shippable, Drone, or things, this will pick up the code, test the code, um, and release the executable as an artifact. And um, the test servers would have uh, all the, what you call web services, web applications, uh, databases, all working together. The QA would test on the test server, and the operations would, uh, the DevOps would actually push it to staging area, and whenever appropriate, things would be switch in production. And in this, a lot of tools are used like Chef, Puppetard, more popular tools, Ansible, SaltStax uh, are also uh, uh, the bigger tools in, in this case. And their virtualization uh, happening everywhere, either on-premise uh, using VMware or on the cloud using Amazon, uh, Azure, Google Cloud, whatever it is. And then there are CI tools like Jenkins, Bamboo, or uh, Travis. So this is a very simplistic uh, view of this thing. We're gonna take this view, uh, we're gonna keep this view in front of us, and then we're gonna see how Docker helps us in that. So we're gonna cover a little bit of Docker 101 for people who are not aware of it or people who want to understand it better. So Docker provides what we call as a Docker daemon, which runs on Linux and it is used to run lightweight containers. Applications are dockerized. That means application actually put into a container. And these containers can run on your laptops to your production servers. And the promise is they will run exactly in the same manner. So if these containers are running fine on your laptop, there will be no issues running those containers on uh, your production environment. And you can take images of these containers and you can save them on uh, Docker Hub, which is much more like GitHub. So whenever you want to deploy a new version of your application, you don't actually pass on 
the executable, the config, and things like that. But you just say, I want to take this version of a Docker image and put it up. Also, like I mentioned, your applications, applications today, is the, today are always distributed. The most interesting way of saying it is your normal web server. If you put WordPress, you will still require WordPress PHP server and a uh, MySQL database behind it. Uh, other case could be means that where you have a Node.js server and a MongoDB database. These could be living in different uh, containers, but they can be wired together using certain Docker commands. And we're going to look into that in a jiffy. So what is a container? Uh, so right, if I may uh, stop you for a little bit, I'm, I'm seeing some questions around uh, how do you deploy to a, a, a production site that is outside of the dev shop and does it necessarily require a Docker Hub or is there any other mechanism available? So the, like I said, whichever machine, whether it's in premise or it's in a cloud, where you need to de deploy Docker, you need to have Docker daemon running. Somehow you will go, you will, you'll be connecting to this Docker daemon and you'll be telling this Docker daemon, hey, go ahead and download Docker image from some registry. Now these registries uh, could be the public Docker hub or it could be a registry which you have hosted on premise or inside your VPN or you can even have private registries on Docker Hub and you download those images and then you run those images. And we will look at that uh, in upcoming slides. So when I describe Docker in more detail, that part will be more clear. Okay. So the move on? Yeah. yeah. So basically there's, a, there's always this comparison about virtual machines doing the same thing and Docker containers doing the same thing. So how do you compare it? Now this is an official diagram as to you know how the comparison goes. Think about you have got your uh, production machines and you're actually building towers on top of that which has the guest OS which could be 600 MB to 1 GB and then you know all the libraries on top of that and then finally your app on top of that. So this is quite heavyweight when you use virtual machines. On the container side I'm going to describe this thing in a uh, in a simple English manner. There are things like namespace, C groups and App Armor on Linux on on Linux systems, uh, and these have been around since 2000, and they have been you know in under development. And what they do is they let's say they give you a cardboard box, and you actually put your process in the cardboard box, and you have got this multiple cardboard boxes on top of uh, Docker Daemon, which makes your application or makes your process feel like hey I'm on a different operating system. And this is my names, this is my file system, these are my ports, this is my CPU share and everything. So that's what Docker actually does. It doesn't use hypervisor or entire OS, but somehow using namespace, C groups and app armor, it gives the illusion to the process that it's on in an isolated environment. And that's been working pretty well since the last two, three years. So so right, one more question uh, that has come in from the audience. Uh, is uh, if if I install Docker where you know let's say um, you have the same database uh, uh, would would it as, uh, uh, would each application have its own version of the database and so uh, essentially Docker would uh, uh, install. Uh, the same database uh, over and over for e once for each image. Or, or, or do you think uh, Docker works well only if there is one uh, image deployed per machine? So that question is not very clear to me, but let me answer the question in a manner um, um, I would deploy things. So typically what happens is you have a database server which you Dockerize, you put it in Docker container and you host it either on the same machine or on a different machine and then on some other or the same machine you would have other containers which would be running your web server or things like that and you will be connecting uh, the applications, the web servers with the uh, database container. Now uh, you might have five web servers running, uh, five different, uh, so you might have five uh, Docker containers running for the web server or scalability. You might have just one 
uh, database container running behind that, and um, and this could all connect to the same database container. So whatever you do, typically uh, in in current scenario uh, of distributed applications, you can pretty much mimic all of those things when you're working with Docker containers. Okay. So what is Docker? This is a better view of Docker. So Docker is two parts. It's an engine, and that engine works on uh, your laptop or the production machines, and this engine has two parts. One is a Docker daemon. Docker daemon is, is basically uh, responsible for running your containers, making sure they're running on, set, they're basically exposing certain ports, or they're they are linked to other containers, things like that. The Docker daemon controls uh, the containers, and Docker client, client is what we use as a command line tool to talk to the Docker daemon. The good thing over here is a Docker client on one machine can connect to Docker daemon on other machine. And typically, if you use certificates, that connection is very, very secure. So this way, you could have uh, multiple machines hosted uh, on, on a cloud where you have Docker daemon running. And then you can have your Docker client connect to those machines and have them pull Docker image either from a private repository or a public repository and uh, run your applications. So that's one part. The second part is Docker Hub, which is being provided by Docker. Docker Hub is a publicly available repository of uh, uh, Docker images. Uh, they have public repository and private repository. Think about Docker Hub equivalent to GitHub. GitHub is for code. Docker Hub is for Docker images. Now, the public repository would contain images like Mongo, Node.js, Go language stack, Rails stack, and the private repositories are paid repositories where you would have a complete uh, image of your business application. So you can push and pull from the private repositories, and that's what you can use to uh, deploy the next version of application in production or to roll back. Finally, we have something called as Docker file. A Docker file is nothing but a DSL. It's a, so when you so basically, you can do a couple of things on Docker using Docker Client. You can say, I want to pull the base image of Node.js, and then I want to uh, check out my GitHub repository over there, and I want to install NPM or Grunt, and then, and then I want to run them so that the app runs. So all these things, you can basically put it up in the, sorry about this. All these things, you can typically put it up in, uh, uh, this Docker file, and it works out. Any questions over here? So, uh, uh, one question I'm seeing uh, here, Roy, is uh, when you talk about Docker client and Docker daemon, uh, and you mentioned uh, certificate based. So, is, is this sort of self-issued certificate, or is it through a trusted uh, third party? And in that case. Uh, how does this thing work, and uh, uh, or is this more like a secure shell kind of thing? Well, I I haven't looked at it at that detail, Ashish. So I'll, I'll invite people to actually go over the documentation of Docker, and and then find out about that. Okay. So we need to hurry up a bit because uh, we've got a couple of slides about the use cases and things. So I'll just be you know uh, going uh, quickly uh, through certain things. I'll come back to Docker file system later on because otherwise it actually eat uh, a lot of uh, um, time. But in short, Docker file system is layer by layer. Uh, so yeah. if I base my base, if if my base image is uh, Ubuntu, I might have a Node.js image on top of that. I might have my GitHub uh, source code on, on top of that. If I do a npm install or a Ruby gem install, that becomes a layer on top of that. And a topmost layer is the writable layer. And what you can do is you can always commit this layer, and uh, you can commit this uh, set of layers as a new Docker image and push it up on uh, Docker Hub. And when you do the pull, it's like Lego blocks. If I already have that layer present locally, that layer won't be pulled, but the new layers will be pulled. But we'll cover this thing uh, after a while when we have equivalent uh, slides about this, but I'm just gonna rush a little bit ahead. So this is a Docker uh, file. Uh, there are typically three things in a Docker file. 
first thing you see is a from docker file node that's like username and the image name so my docker is uh, continuous based on out of this particular base image do run this commands whenever each command is run and it changes the file system a new layer in the file system is added and finally at the end you will see cm cmd which is what command to actually run remember docker will provide you with one command to run it at the end uh, and that one command can run uh, numerous processes which you want uh, uh, to do this is more like a single responsibility principle where you say my web, my web, my web application would run uh, node web or unicorn rails or tomcat things like that my solar uh, docker container would run uh, tomcat solar things like that and finally these are few examples of how you build the docker image uh, docker image this is how you build a docker image if the docker file is present in your local directory and I'm tagging the image as Rohit Khatol slash node and if I want to run that image I use the docker run command minus D is for daemon minus P is for port mapping uh, finally a developer would push the docker image like docker push and an operations person would pull it uh, like this so it's actually a clone of github uh, but github for images so I'll, I'll pause over here before I head over into use cases and the first use case would be the uh, continuous delivery use case. Uh, questions Ashish? Uh, not at this moment so maybe we can move forward. Okay. So first thing use case is continuous delivery and uh, let me clarify what docker is good at and where docker doesn't actually help. So when I talk about moving the business logic from developer's box uh, to the scrutiny of continuous uh, integration through the eyes of QA uh, to staging where it's generally available to production, that's where Docker excels. Because what it's, what it's doing is actually putting everything in a box and moving the box around and all you have to do is just power up the box and it runs the same way. Now when you take uh, things to production, it's not as simple as just moving Docker images. Basically, you will have a set of these you have set of microservices, or let's say you have uh, Python. Uh, uh, you, you got a couple of web servers, you got indexing servers, you got caching servers, you got uh, some NoSQL servers, you got some traditional database servers. All of them are talking together, and then there is a case of high availability. There are supposed to be five web servers running at any given time. If uh, the load increases, they have to increase the load. And if things go down, uh, things have to balance out and new nodes have to come up. Basically, everything you have been doing on Amazon Cloud and things like that, uh, that's not what Docker really shines in. It does help in over there, but it helps in indirectly. That's why we have to look at something called as Kubernetes from Google. And if the time permits, at the end of uh, this presentation, we'll talk a little bit about Kubernetes. Just be clear. That Docker shines in one particular area and it's not a silver bullet for everything. So here's a continuous delivery use case which happens now. A developer would actually run his code inside, uh, run his code or binary of that code inside a container and see if it's working fine. And then the developer will check in the code. And when he checks in the code, somewhere either there is a Docker image created for the application he developed uh, or that docker image is created by the CIT server itself and that image is now called as system under test when it's in the CI uh, phase. The test cases could be put in the another docker container and this docker container could be linked to the SUT docker container so the test server knows uh, the other docker containers and that there's an app running inside that and could test it out. So the, the SUT is the same Docker container which would be actually deployed in production. It has nothing more, nothing less than what, what, what goes on production. Then this thing goes to the test server. You got this topology defined where you have all these Docker containers talking to each other. Same thing happens at staging. Things become stable, it goes to production. Uh, but very important thing which happens is either after CIT or after the QA cycle, 
you start marking these containers as version 2.1 or version 2.2 or version 2.3 and you keep on deploying them and that's where continuous delivery is happening. Now often uh, or rarely uh, depends on how you're working uh, there are issues in production and you would want to roll back and all you have to do is just uh, go back to a previous version of the application image and deploy. So uh, Docker makes uh, rollbacks and upgrades very simple in that case. So that's the simplistic view of continuous delivery. Now we'll see a couple of other cases about continuous delivery uh, so right, going one on. One question that is, uh, has come up on, on specifically on this slide uh, is uh, when you talk about deployment and rollbacks, what sort of uh, you know elapsed time are we talking about? How how long does it take to uh, deploy a new image? Is it like half an hour? Or is it a few minutes or seconds? Quite frankly, uh, it's milliseconds to seconds, or max minutes. That's what I would say. It's not uh, the traditional minutes to hours thing kind of things. So if you, if you have and if you're talking about microservices, they would only have uh, one service per container. It's actually in microseconds. What happens is these images are already available. All that is happening is uh, the new image is switched on, and when the new image is working fine, uh, the old image is switched off, and then you will have some mechanism of diverting the traffic from the uh, old image to the new image, uh, old container to the new container. So it's actually very, very fast. Uh, whenever I'm developing applications on Node and things like that, it is actually a milliseconds to a few seconds only. That's great. So here's a developer scenario. Let's say if you're starting with Docker today in your team and you're building a Rails application, one of your lead developers would go in and download a Rails image and he would say, okay, the image is fine, but I need some uh, things added to that image. So he would run that image locally and he would do some kind of a SSH into that and uh, modify that image and then he would uh, commit and push the image to Docker. But while he does that, he names, he commits and pushes the image under the name, let's say, Rohit Khatol slash, uh, uh, you know, ROR. And then my team knows that, okay, Rohit Khatol slash ROR is the image which we are going to use for our development purposes. So they all use that. Now the advantage of doing this is your development environment. Everybody has a consistent development environment. Let it be Linux, Windows, or uh, Mac. It just works the same. And that's the advantage of this. And this base image becomes the base image for your uh, application image. Is this part clear? Any questions popping up? No, looks good. The next part is uh, for developer productivity. So the blue part below is the host machine, which is a developer's laptop. This laptop has Git installed. There's a JetBrains or Eclipse installed over there. There are browsers installed over there. Now, on top of this thing, the developer installs Docker Daemon, which is in green, and then downloads the web ROR uh, image and runs it uh, over there. The, uh, the thing in orange is the container running. Now, what happens over here is he can map a folder inside his container to a folder on his uh, laptop and then he can use uh, git uh, to pull and push from the src folder and the same effect uh, and the same thing is synced to app src he can do eclipse or jetbrains uh, uh, coding on his laptop and things get synced up and but the application is running inside the container and let's say uh, the port 80 of ror is mapped to port 8080 of the host machine of his laptop so he can launch his Chrome and say, hey, HTTP localhost 8080, let me just see how my application works. This is very, very productive because the developer uses everything which he loves about his laptop, but the code runs in a consistent environment. Any questions popping up? So, uh, right, a couple of questions will come in, and I think we might have covered this one, but uh, 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 one, of, uh, one of the participant wants to uh, get clarification on uh, does Docker work on Windows or not? And I believe you, you, you covered it, but uh, you may want to reiterate yeah. that one. 
So Docker works on Windows and Mac, but it works slightly different than it, how it works on uh, Ubuntu or any other Linux distribution. Docker needs a Linux kernel below it to run. Now, your Mac doesn't have the same Linux kernel, and Windows obviously doesn't have the Linux kernel at all. So there's something called as a boot to Docker, which is available. What it does is it launches a virtual machine on your Windows and Mac, and it has a very thin layer of the Docker uh, Linux kernel, which Docker requires. And then, uh, once you boot up this virtual uh, machine, you can use the Docker commands as you use it on Ubuntu or, or any other Linux. So, slight difference in additional tool required, but it's very easy to get used to and works almost the same way across all these three platforms. And then, a uh, second question that has come in is, uh, uh, you're showing all these source uh, directories and uh, what if you didn't want to actually deploy a source code but actually wanted to deploy just binaries, how would that work? That is also very easy. Uh, what you do is, in that case, you have two Docker containers. One Docker container is where uh, you would compile the source and that would dump uh, the binary in a common shared locations. See, you can share, uh, con you can share folders amongst Docker containers. So the first uh, Docker container, we'll call it as the, the code builder Docker container. And you can launch a Docker container in a way that it launches itself, it copies the source, it compiles it, it creates a binary, puts it in a common location, and the container dies. And the second container is your uh, uh, application container, which only has the binary. So this way, what happens is, instead of using one container, you're using two containers, one for building the code and one for running the binary. But both this environment are consistent across all the developers. And your application container is exactly the same container which goes into production. And if you want, your QA people can have third container to actually connect to the uh, application container and test it out. Okay, that's very helpful. So let's go to the CS scenario. And, and we are actually uh, running out of time quite sooner than I expected, but it, I'm, I'm happy we reached the CS scenario. It's the most important part in this slide. Now think about this uh, blocks over here as building blocks, code push, uh, uh, pull the code, uh, test the code, test feature, uh, build a application Docker image, run application Docker image, and publish an application Docker image. Think about all this as uh, Lego blocks. Now the good thing about the CI is you can do whatever you want, in whichever manner which suits you, or whichever, whichever phase you are. So this is an option for if you're just getting started with Docker and the new CI tools. The idea is you uh, you push the code, and somebody is, and let's say you push the code to GitHub, and your CI is listening to GitHub, it pulls the code, it tests the code, and here I'm saying it tests the code directly. So here there's already a Node.js environment for Node, ROR environment for ROR, so typically a more traditional CI uh, thing. And once the code is tested and you're satisfied that, okay, things would work fine, uh, or you tested some features also over here, and you know that things will be fine, you actually build a Docker image. You have custom scripts to build a Docker image and custom scripts to push publish the Docker image. Now, this is not uh, idealistic, uh, but I still put it up just to tell that, you know, it's, it's up to you as to what stage you are in and how you want to handle it. It looks like this when you look at it in the whole cycle. The developer pushes the code to GitHub. There are CI servers like Drone, Shippable, CircleCI, CodeShip, Travis CI, even Jenkins, although I'm not a great fan of uh, Jenkins uh, just because it's, it just looks so old. Uh, what is the, many of these things, what they do is uh, they have some integration with Docker where they run Docker and then they pull code on top of Docker, and they run the test, and if everything goes fine, then you can execute some scripts, and typically I will do the work of building the application image in those scripts and pushing the application image to Docker Hub. Now remember, uh, if you look at drone or shippable or circle CI, or uh, things like that, they claim to have support for Docker, but they don't use your Docker image uh, but they use their own Docker images for Node, Ruby. So they, they detect your environment, or they ask you, what is your environment? 
and then they use that kind of image to test your code. Uh, while it works in most of the cases, it's not uh, the best way of uh, doing things for end-to-end -end testing. Uh, so I did say a lot of things over here. I'm sure people would have been having a few questions over here. Uh, Ashish? Now, uh, I think uh, we're good. So I, good. I, I think we should keep going. We have about five more minutes. Uh, the next scenario is you do a code push. A code push. This code push would automatically build a Docker image. Uh, they typically, Docker Hub can listen to GitHub repository, on and on every push, it can create a new image, publish the whole image, and then you run a Docker container, and then you uh, test it out, and then you mark that image as a good image. So in this case, code is pushed. Uh, Docker Hub is listening to GitHub. Uh, it creates a new uh, image, and then you can use that image. Uh, to do things like that. So drone eye doesn't exactly support it, but I was able to use uh, to hack drone eye to do something uh, similar. Uh, this is a better example because you're actually testing uh, the same Docker container which will be deployed on uh, the on the production machine. So that's uh, the example of CI scenario. The last thing is staging production, which is quite simplistic. Uh, whenever you have a trigger of some kind which says, okay, we need to push the next version. Uh, you use, you basically use host machine on MA, uh, AWS Azure, things like that, and you just pull up the Docker image from the, your private Docker hub or any, any other Docker hub, and you run the image. Simple as that. So that covers the part of uh, CI. Any major questions over here? No, not so far. So let's go to cloud portability. It will just take five seconds. The thing with cloud portability is uh, you're putting Docker layer, Docker daemon layer on all these things. So now even Amazon AWS provides inherent Docker support with uh, Docker with uh, Elastic Cloud uh, uh, service. Google Cloud has Kubernetes. Microsoft Azure also supports uh, uh, Docker. DigitalOcean also has machines with Docker base. So it's like virtual machine for Java, simple as that. And then you have got tools like Docker, which can connect to these directly. Or you have new tools like Docker Swarm or Docker IO and Flocker. Uh, so Flocker is a tool, Docker IO and Tutumar services for doing the, these things for you. So just remember these services and look over them when you get a chance. Uh, going any deeper in this uh, won't be any help given that we are already running very late. So the next thing is mean stack. Uh, MeanStack is, uh, the reason MeanStack comes uh, over here is uh, MeanStack is uh, a framework which generates code for you. Uh, typically it contains Node.js server and MongoDB uh, so database. Uh, so it, it provides uh, necessary Docker files uh, for you to launch one container for a Node.js server and one container for the MongoDB database. These are the two files which are Docker specific file. The fig file is uh, nothing but uh, telling how these two Docker containers are linked to each other and what ports do they actually open up. So web is linked to DB and web container is hosted on 3000 and MongoDB is hosted on 2707. And the web container is built from a Docker file from a local folder. And this is the example of Docker file. You would skip this today uh, and just go ahead. Uh, the last thing which, is, which I want to cover quickly in a minute because you're running out of time is microservices. Microservices are basically uh, new age services which are no longer monolithic in nature, but you have different, different uh, 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 microservices for different, different needs. For example, for a Netflix-like site, you would have a recommendation engine uh, developed by a separate uh, group, a profile uh, web service developed by a separate group, movie listing developed by a separate group. And this group would have complete uh, independence to use different stacks which are, which are you know, required for that. So you can see each service using different, different platform and different, different databases. And services are also using each other as required. And this helps because all the services can be developed in parallel and their deployment cycles could be different. And everything is hosted on node. If, you, if recommendation engine requires more scalability, you host more nodes more uh, uh, Docker containers, and they're all behind a gateway or reverse proxy for uh, scalability, for load balancing. Um, so how does microservices help? 
uh, how does Docker help in microservices? Because microservices are really hard to run. They need very strong DevOps practice, and Docker provides that. It saves microservices as a unit, and more containers is more scaled, and it improves the developer and operations relationship. But just one last talk, one last slide before I um, end my presentation is um, Docker is not sufficient when you want to deploy microservices. You require things like scheduling, high availability, redundancy. You need to look at the health. You need to see how many uh, number of nodes are running. You need to increase them or decrease them. So for this, Docker is not sufficient. And Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes from Google is something uh, uh, which is which you have to look at. Uh, Google Cloud provides it by default. Uh, you can also deploy it on Amazon Azure. And there's a new player in this area called as Giant Swarm, which you can take a look at. So with this, I would uh, kind of end the presentation, uh, uh, Ashish. Uh, so, so, uh, so, yeah, so Roy, thanks a lot for, uh, for for walking us through Docker. This uh, very informative, at least for me. Uh, we have about uh, 10 minutes uh, uh, available for any Q&A. And, uh, and, and, and while we are uh, sort of waiting for uh, some of these questions to come in, uh, I just wanted to uh, remind our audience uh, 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 about Synergip. Uh, so, so uh, I know, Rohit, if you could uh, advance the slide to, uh, yeah, so if you needed to uh, get a hold of me, uh, uh, you have my contact information, uh, Rohit's contact information uh, is included uh, in this presentation as well. Uh, uh, I wanted to take a quick minute to um, cover Synergy in a nutshell. Uh, so basically, our approach to uh, uh, to providing services to our customers is is to be the uh, 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 the trusted uh, partner uh, uh, for essentially mid and small size uh, technology startups. And uh, our focus is is bringing together a team of high caliber individuals as a dedicated team that uh, uh, that works for you as an extension of your in-house team. And uh, 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 because of the dedicated nature of this team, uh, the IP of the of our client that lives in people's heads, uh, it, it, it never goes away. And I think that's, that's a, a constant challenge uh, that uh, our customers face as they try to scale up. Uh, we, are, we are, of course, big believers in Agile. Um, so uh, uh, some of these practices help us uh, align very closely with not just our customers, but our customers' customers. And uh, of course, uh, the, uh, and the benefit of uh, uh, offshore economics is, is sort of built into it. Uh, I want to go to uh, 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 a quick uh, review of what's coming up in our next webinar. Uh, Rohit, if you could move me over to uh, slide 68. Yeah. So the, our next webinar is is about uh, a life cycle of a user story. Uh, Michael Hall is uh, he's he's been on this webinar series several times. Uh, very seasoned agile practitioner, uh, and uh, he he's gonna uh, he's gonna talk about uh, what happens to a user story, how it how it's born, uh, what happens in its life, and how it dies. So uh, it's it's an interesting conversation to be had uh, uh, for uh, on March 17th. Uh, you will see. Uh, invites coming in or, uh, or uh, requests uh, coming out for uh, an Indu register. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I, I'm just, uh, uh, let's just uh, put up, I guess, the last slide and, and then uh, uh, if there are any questions, uh, we'll just give it a minute or two for uh, people to ask questions. So, uh, Rohit, uh, if you would like to summarize anything or make any, um, you know, uh, closing comments, uh, we're good time. Sure. Well, I'll just take over uh, a few slides which I just kept so that, you know, people, if there are no questions, I could just ask 
more information? No, one question, Rohit, just just come in as uh, can SharePoint be deployed in Docker? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Quite frankly, I don't know. Uh, uh, I'll have to check actually, and and also you can check it on Google. I'm not a Microsoft person, and I'm, I don't know uh, whether SharePoint binaries are uh, cross platform now. Now that the doc, now that the Microsoft uh, ASP.NET platform is being you know targeted towards cross platform, I don't know whether if it's cross platform. So I don't know the answer to that just yet. But yeah, yeah. yeah. So I think uh, Roid, one uh, one thing is it's a question of like you said, it's a question of version for sure. Uh, but uh, uh, I think with the boot to Docker, uh, it should be uh, it should be possible. Uh, to do something like that, but uh, we would uh, we would probably it's need to do a proof of concept to a, really understand. It's more about a mono platform. So right. to answer, right. you guys can understand mono platform. So mono is a, a Linux platform from Microsoft, and uh, they are basically working to uh, move some of the .NET stuff on mono platform. And if uh, uh, apparently uh, whatever SharePoint is built on supports mono, then SharePoint can work on. Uh, Docker because Docker is a uh, Docker can run Mono because Mono is Linux. Okay, I see. Okay. So just some things to take a look at in future. Uh, in this year, there are three Docker products being launched. One is called as a Docker machine. Uh, second thing is called as Docker Swarm, and last is uh, still being uh, kind of designed, which is called as Docker Compose. Uh, Docker Machines makes it easy for you to create machines everywhere. Let it be your local uh, virtual box or Amazon and things like that. Think about it like Vagrant with Vagrant providers. So you can create Docker Machines locally uh, with minus the virtual box provider or on DigitalOcean or, or uh, Amazon Web Services and things like that. So it makes it very easy to create Docker Machines everywhere. This is still in uh, alpha or beta. And we are expecting this to come out properly in the second half. And this will be actually helping uh, us uh, make it very easy to create Docker machines uh, anywhere. The next thing is Docker Swarm. Swarm is nothing but a clustering tool, which uh, basically allows you to create a cluster. Uh, this is where you see how you create a cluster. And then you can uh, add machines to Docker cluster. And finally, what you do is you just point your uh, point to the Docker Docker uh, uh, cluster manager and run whatever Docker commands you would run against a machine against the cluster. So it's like saying if I want to pull and run MongoDB on a Docker machine, uh, I just say Docker run minus the Mongo. If I had to do the same thing against a cluster, I would just point it to a cluster and depending on the capacity of the cluster, that thing will be deployed. So things are moving away from machine notion to a notion of a compute strength, notion of a cluster. This is something which you need to watch out. Docker Compose is nothing but the uh, same thing which you saw earlier called as FIG. So this, it is heavily derived from FIG. Um, so it, it's basically just defining uh, a single file uh, where you say, I want this image on this particular, uh, uh, with uh, this particular box and link to this particular uh, Docker container exposing these ports and things like that. So this is an orchestration tool. Its current status is limbo. It's not decided how it will go ahead. But definitely take a look at these three tools. This, uh, they will be actually maturing the second half. And uh, finally, uh, look at what Amazon is doing and Google Cloud and Azure are doing in terms of adapt adapting Docker. And that's where I would just, you know, and my things and invite any more questions before you know we just run out of time. So I had a, a, a similar question coming around uh, MS SQL. So I think this is this is a topic that uh, we sh we can uh, sort of uh, uh, explore in more detail, perhaps in a in a subsequent uh, conversation, uh, which is. Uh, how how to use Docker uh, in a predominantly Microsoft uh, environment? Right, right, right. And unfortunately, guys, I'm not uh, very prepared to answer this question since I'm I I do work on multiple stacks, but unfortunately, I hadn't had time to you know 
pick up the Microsoft stack. So, uh, uh, like yes. Ashish said, if we actually have a follow-up, we would definitely answer that in that particular thing. All right. So, uh, with that, I think uh, we are just about uh, 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 hitting the uh, end of the hour. And uh, Rohit, I, I do appreciate uh, you getting on and, and uh, talking about Docker here today. I want to remind the audience uh, that this uh, uh, presentation uh, and recording is uh, going to be available on our YouTube cha channel. And uh, keep an eye out for the invite for the next webinar. And hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks. All right, now. Bye.